Hello everyone and welcome to Radio Miles, a podcast about Flan O'Brien with me, your host Toby Harris. This podcast is made possible with the support of Birkbeck College, University of London, and in my first episode I'm joined by Joseph Brooker, Professor of Modern Literature at Birkbeck. So, in the next 30 minutes, you'll get an amazing insight into the life and times of Flan O'Brien, including some rarely heard archival footage. Let's get started. My first guest is Joseph Brooker, who is Professor of Modern Literature at Birkbeck. He is one of the leading UK experts on Flan O'Brien, the author of a book on Flan published in 2005, as well as numerous articles and a keynote lecture delivered at the 2015 conference of the International Flan O'Brien Society. Joe has also published books on Joyce, the literature of the 1980s and the work of Jonathan Leatham continues to publish regularly on Flan O'Brien, such as a recent note on the role of Constantine Curran, an associate of Enolan's Fred Neil Montgomery and James Joyce in a Radio Iran broadcast marking Joyce's 56th birthday. Welcome to the podcast, Joe. Thanks, Toby. Good to be here. Um, so to get us started, some of our listeners might be um, a bit new. They might be new to Flan or, or Miles overall. They might have never read a word. Um, would you mind giving us a thumbnail sketch? He has a lot of names as a writer, for example. How did he get hold of them and what did his life look like? Well, yeah, that's a story that one could expand and expand and or, or, or try to give us as brief uh, an account as possible. He, he, he was a man who lived from 1911 to 1966 and he died age 54. Uh, so um, a, a writer who is a writer of the mid 20th century or the early to mid 20th century, really writing between the mainly the 30s, 40s, 50s, and to some extent 60s. He's an Irish writer. Uh, he, he was from Straban in the north of Ireland, uh, but he moved, his family moved to Dublin uh, when he was um, young and he became a Dubliner. He became very much a Dublin man, a Dubliner, a Dublin writer, a voice of Dublin. So that's one way to see him as one of the voices of Dublin in writing in the 20th century. In terms of his name, um, it's most simple to call him Brian O'Nolan. Uh, there is some complexity about that, and this is a writer where names are unusually complex. Um, for one thing, you get Irish spellings and pronunciations Brian uh, O'Nulon, um, and you get some people saying that uh, the that he that he was always called Brian, and you get other Irish people saying, "Oh no, actually we called him Brian," uh, and uh, different uh, different uh, uh, accounts, even of something like that, as well as uh, O'Nulon, uh, O'Nolan. He also sometimes signed himself as Nolan, Brian Nolan. So there's a curious amount of, um, of, of variation about this. Now, those are what we can consider his real names, but he also had literary names, pen names, and most of his writing was done under those names. The most famous is, is Flann O'Brien. That's the, 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 uh, the, the name under which he published novels, starting with uh, a book called At Swim Two Birds in 1939. And, and going on really till his, his last novel, The Dorky Archive in 1964. And there are, uh, well, basically there are five novels. Um, well, most of the novels were published under, under the name Flann O'Brien, even, even there there's some complexity actually. But Flann O'Brien then is the most, is the best known name. And actually it came about originally through him writing letters to uh, the papers in the 1930s and joining in with controversies and mocking other people. And he would use the name Flan O'Brien or F. O'Brien. And he kind of kept this name um, uh, to, uh, uh, when, he, when, he, when he became a novelist, he decided to keep this name. Um, he, the name Flan O'Brien, I, I recall that he said it combined a very old name Flan with a very ordinary name, O'Brien. So that's that's clear enough. There are then some other names though. The, the, the next best name is Miles Nogopoline, which itself has a couple of different spellings. Uh, but Miles Nogopoline was the name that he adopted when he became a newspaper columnist on the Irish Times in 1940. And he carried that on, uh, on and off, but mostly on 
um, until his death in 1966. Uh, so Mars Nagopolin is then, is then an, another identity for him and another name under which he writes um, as, a, as a newspaper columnist, which was essentially a comic column. It's mainly comedy and satire and fun, although it also becomes sometimes polemical, angry, serious as well, more so as it goes on perhaps. Um, the question arises, where did that name Mars Nagopolin come from? Um, that is a name taken from literature. It was the name of a character in Dion Boussico's play, The Colleen Bourne in uh, the 19th century. And it's a kind of stage Irish character, a kind of rollicking Irishman. And the name means uh, miles of the little horses or miles of the ponies. So he's already taking on the name of a character, a, a stage character, a stage Irishman, maybe. That name itself has actually already been taken from a novel of the Collegians by Gerald Griffin earlier, which was Boussico's source material. So it's a very intertextual name. It's a literary name. It's an artificial name uh, that he is using as his name, as if it's his own name on the top of this column. So there's a clear sense of artifice, staginess, intertextuality um, about that. Now, finally, that we should mention that there are some other names which are used less often. Um, for one thing, when he wrote some other newspaper columns for other newspapers, he, he would use other names. For instance, George Noel was one, and I think John James Doe was another. So those are clearly pseudonyms. They, they're obvious pseudonyms, but they, they're sort of differentiating himself again from the Miles Nagopoline name. And also, I mentioned earlier that he um, had spent a lot of time in the late 30s and early 40s writing letters to the papers, especially the Irish Times, joining in controversies, mocking and attacking people. And he increasingly did this, not just by writing as Flann O'Brien, but by writing under different names, under a kind of blizzard of different names, uh, like uh, Whit Cassidy, Lear O'Connor, Luna O'Connor, um, uh, John O'Ruddy, many others. The, the one complexity there is that other friends of his also joined in uh, that process. And so we, we're not really sure which of those names were his and which belonged to other people. And that's really yet another confusing aspect of this, that this writer, Brian O'Nolan or Flann O'Brien, um, was some, he was, he was some, somewhat of a, a participant in a group or what we could call a circle of writers. So there's a, a fellow called Niall uh, Montgomery, who was particularly important, who was probably Brian and Erland's best friend, uh, or they had their falling outs and their difficulties, but I'd say they were be their best friends, really. And Montgomery was a very talented man, a writer, an architect, an architectural critic. He wrote some of the columns uh, as Miles Nagopoli some, uh, uh, in the Irish Times. So there's an element of collaboration, of mixing authorship there, there's also another very good friend of theirs called Niall Sheridan and uh, a, a very good critic called Maeve Long has demonstrated how uh, uh, Sheridan and O'Nolan may have borrowed ideas off each other in doing their work. So there's an element of authorship being a bit mixed here, a bit muddied and a bit pluralized as well, on top of the fact that uh, this is a, a man with so many names. I think finally, you know, in terms of this introduction, I should just mention what books did he publish. There's That Swim Two Birds, 1939, a remarkable kind of anti-novel, uh, which breaks up narrative in a confusing way, but is also riotously funny. It's thoroughly a comic novel. Um, he then wrote a book called The Third Policeman uh, in late 1939, early 1940 and tried to get it published with the same publisher, Longman's, but um, they wouldn't take it, that it was too fantastical. And uh, he essentially put it away in a drawer for the, the rest of his life, um, told people he'd lost the manuscript, and it wasn't published until a year after he died when his widow, Evelyn, um, sent it to the publisher and, and they published it. Um, that novel, The Third Policeman, is now regarded as a great masterpiece of 20th century literature, but he didn't live to see it uh, published in his own time. Uh, but it's a remarkable book. Then there are three other novels uh, to mention. <clears throat> One is um, Anne Belbach in Irish, because this is very much a multilingual writer who wrote in Irish as well as, as, well as English. Anne Belbach, which is um, translated as The Poor Mouth. The poor mouth meaning um, putting on poverty, begging 
Um, and that is a, a, a short novel, which is a satire of peasant memoirs from the west of Ireland, from places like maybe the Aran Islands, maybe um, the islands off Kerry, um, and, and, and well, not just Ireland, but, but life in general in the west of Ireland. Uh, among Irish speaking peasants and that there have been lots of memoirs and, and books written by these people and that book is somewhat of a parody, an affectionate parody of that genre. It's regarded as a very significant book, particularly within the, uh, the modern Irish literature, Irish language literature canon, but it's also widely admired and enjoyed in English. Finally, there are two other novels published in 1961 and 1964, The Hard Life and The Dorky Archive. And those have points of interest. The Dorky Archive re uh, rehashes some material from the, the manuscript of Third Policeman, which hadn't been published. But it's fair to say that those novels are less accomplished than the first three. And uh, although they have interest to, to scholars and to general readers, um, they're not such major works. I, th I think just the last thing I'd say is that this is a writer who has increasingly received scholarly attention and we academics like to look at him, but he's also a writer who's always had popular affection and he's always had a, um, a readership among ordinary people, certainly in Ireland, also around the world, who just enjoy this wonderful uh, sense of humor that he has. I think that's a really interesting point and, um... It's one of those cases where the academic professional interest in Flann O'Brien is driven by that groundswell of just popularity as such an easy writer. As you said, some of it's quite baffling, especially in terms of his identity and bamboozling in terms of the plots. But actually, there's a kind of comic power and enjoyability to the writing that just hooks us and keeps yes. us interested over the years. So let's dip into that now. Um, one of the other things the podcast is going to ask us to do is to read a passage for the benefit of listeners who may be new to Flann O'Brien, almost give people a flavour of, of what we're talking about, why we're all here. Uh, so you, I believe, have picked an extract easily available in the Best of Miles anthology of the Christine Long column. So I'll, I'll let you introduce it and, and give us a passage. Yes, the column is called Krushkin Lawn and published in the Irish Times, as I said, from 1940. And this particular anthology, The Best of Miles, originally published, I think, in 67 or 60, 68, maybe it was. Um, yes, uh, 68, um, was, was the first major anthology to be really widely available to bring this to, to a, a public, not just in Ireland, I suppose, but in England and, 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 and beyond. This particular book focuses on material from the, I think, the first half of the 1940s. One of the, he had various sort of um, uh, comic setups and comic sort of trends that he would run at different times in the column. And one of them was this, something he called the catechism of cliché. And I think it will be demonstrated if I just simply read out a page or so of this. It, this particular one begins appropriately with reference to the newspaper, given that that was the medium where this appeared. Of what nature is the newspaper in which one craves the courtesy of its space, invaluable and widely read? For what purpose does one crave the courtesy of its space? Saying a few words anent the gas supply. In criticising the gas company, what does one wish to make it clear one holds for the electricity supply board? No brief. Of what nature is the attitude of the gas company to say the least of it? high-handed and dictatorial in the extreme. In what hands should such service not be, and why? Private, because it is a public utility service. What would the situation be were it not so tragic? Humorous. Why is it necessary for the government to take immediate steps to safeguard children from the injuries to health that may be caused by gas rationing? Because the children are the men and women of tomorrow. And what does one hope one's letter will catch? The eye of the powers that be. I, I suppose the first thing that strikes me is this interesting, quite original use of, I guess, what is essentially a, um, a Catholic um, Christian formulation to do with question and answers and, and catechisms in the form of educating ourselves. And Miles is doing something here to educate ourselves because he's almost defamiliarizing these cliches. He's making you 
making you notice them, but he's also rearranging them in quite amusing ways too. So there's a couple of things going on here. Um, would you agree with that characterization? Is there anything you'd add? Um, yes, you know, that's very insightful. Um, this is Catholic Ireland. It's 1940 or so. It's a very Catholic society. It's a society where the church has great power, especially in education. So I think it's right to say that the Catholic catechism may be, well, probably is, uh, or perhaps definitely is, one of the inspirations or one of the, 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 the ideas that's behind this, this reference, this regular reference to catechism. So on the one hand, we have this, this, this uh, church practice, the, this, um, this religious practice, um, uh, which is also, as you rightly say, an educational practice. It's about um, learning and re recitation of knowledge. But he's also dealing here with public discourse. This is about the discourse of the newspaper, the discourse of letters pages, for instance, as in that line, it, um, uh, of what nature is the newspaper in which one craves the courtesy of, of the courtesy of its space, invaluable and widely read. I mean, the implication there, there's always an implication that the, the, the answer can be reinserted back into the question so that the question would have been really meant something like, I crave the courtesy of space in your invaluable and widely read newspapers. There's a certain kind of disassembly and reassembly implied by the relation between question and answer, I think. I agree that he's defamiliarizing cliches, breaking them up, making us think about public discourse. There's actually a line that I will quote uh, from the passage which comes at the end of this section of the book, which is that he, he writes this in a, in a more serious vein. He says, a cliche is a phrase that has become fossilized, its component words deprived of their intrinsic light and meaning by incessant usage. Thus it appears that cliches reflect somewhat the frequency of the incidents of the same situations in life. If this be so, a sociological commentary could be compiled from these items of mortified language. Um, so there's a lot to think about there, uh, but he, he does have a consciousness of cliche as a, a linguistic practice and something that has a kind of social role. And I think we, we might find out a bit more um, about that when we uh, discuss the next um, part of the, the podcast, which is just to listen to a, a passage uh, describing um, the kind of life and times and um, of, of, of land. So this was a, this is a clip from a, a radio broadcast, um, broadcast in 2011 for the centenary of Flans birth on the RT programme Bowman. And it might kind of shake up the discussion a bit by introducing some quite different, um, some quite different themes about uh, his life and times. So here we go. He worked very conscientiously, I, I must say that. Sean McEntee arrived reasonably early at my office. Miles was there before me. When I was leaving, it was generally late in the evening, Miles was then engaged in his own private business. Let's say he was sitting at the typewriter, typing out his stuff. I wondered if you could respond to that report of what it was like to have Brian and Nolan on your, on your uh, uh -huh. ministerial team. Fascinating to hear from such a senior figure, isn't it, in Irish politics? Um, I think, you know, you're quite right that in all that we said about, about Flann O'Brien, I forgot even to mention his civil service career, which was a huge part of his life. Um, I think it was in 1935 that he went into the civil service. When Ireland had a very extensive civil service, um, which uh, had been, I think, partly a legacy of, of British rule, um, and similar, similar structures and, um, and, and um, numbers still obtained. Um, and he would have worked in an office in, in the centre of Dublin, near, near the, the, the River Liffey. Um, but it's worth saying that he, he went into that job <clears throat> because he had to make money for his family, because, um, uh, because his father had, father had died. And um, it, it's just worth emphasising that there was a responsibility about that, that he, he wasn't just um, you know, a great writer or someone with a great imagination who, who, who went off and became a, a romantic poet or something. He was somebody who took responsibility for uh, a family and 
went out and did his best to to make make a living not just for himself but for, for others so that i think that's worth remembering uh that there was a very concrete material uh, pr putting putting bread on the table aspect to his life um the civil service aspect is a very interesting aspect because in one sense it might seem very different from the life of a writer in another sense it might seem to have a lot of echoes as we saw with the catechism of cliche he was interested in linguistic formulas and i think we can be sure that he encountered lots of linguistic formulas in indeed clichés uh, in the kind of memos and the bureaucratic language that he he dealt with in the civil service um, I think that his interest in formula and pedantry and cliche and so on very much is, is something that um, there's a continuity there between the civil service life and uh, the literary life. Um, regarding Sean McEntee's comments, um, I think that one of the things that stri strikes me when I hear that is the fact he called him Miles. Uh, <laughs> he didn't say Brian. Or Brian, or Mr. Mr. Nolan, or he called him Miles. Uh, you know, and that's that sense of again. There's the ambiguity of what do people call him. Different people call him different things. But it's as if he had a sense of I knew that of having almost known that known him best as as Miles, as a, as a newspaper columnist, maybe, huh? or, or or that maybe McEntee felt that that the people listening would know him best as Miles. I'm not sure, but I seem to remember Anthony Cronin, who had been a friend of a Nolan. Uh, saying once in person uh, about a decade or so ago um, that we used to call him Miles. We always called him Miles. I, I think I remember Cronin saying that, but clearly this is somebody where di different people would use different names. But it's interesting that his, you know, his boss, his political boss, uses that name in the in the the recollection. Um, I think it's very, I think it's quite surprising, actually, when McEntee says, you know, he was there before me, he was a diligent yes. worker, he was a great, uh, great bureaucrat. Yes. Um, I think that's interesting. And it speaks to a kind of seriousness and a diligence that's there. And that probably comes through, especially in the early writing, in the care, uh, the care of that he has with language, as we've seen perhaps was also there in the care he took over his job and the care he wrote memos and so on. Yes. Um, although it, it's fair to say that he, he, I think his attitude to work did gradually decline as he drank more and eventually he had to be um, withdrawn from the service in, I think, 1953. So um, I guess McEntee there is talking more about an earlier period uh, but that it's quite interesting to hear that he did he did work diligently. I mean, the other thing was, that I think McEntee's statement finished by saying, you know, at the end of the day, he'd be there on the typewriter. And again, it's so he was also then working on his second job, his job as the columnist, as the writer, and, you know, using the same tools of the trade, really, the typewriter that, that he would use as, as a civil servant. But again, there's a sense of hard work there, isn't there? Doing one job and then going straight over into another job and, and take, taking it um, very seriously as a, as a trade. Um, so we'll, we, that was, uh, we're, we're gonna race backwards in, in time now to um, a, uh, an, another recording uh, from the same documentary, from the Bowman documentary, but um, I haven't been able to pin down exactly when this was made, probably sometime in the 70s, I think. But here's a recording of Brian Nolan's friend, now Sheridan, uh, mm. characterising him in a very particular way. And again, it's another opportunity to hear from his close um, associates um, what they felt about him as a writer. But the astonishing thing about Brian and the thing that I, you know, that sticks in my mind, he certainly, from the very earliest time I knew him, he displayed an extraordinary originality. He never wanted to do the obvious. And if he succeeded in doing something, uh, tick, writing at Swim Two Birds, he would then do something completely different, as in The Third Policeman. He was always moving on to something new, full of ideas, full of invention, and full of mischief, of course. So what do you think of that characterization of Flann O'Brien? It's really interesting. It's great to hear Sheridan, and it's great to hear that that voice from the past, uh, which, as you say, kind of connects us back a little bit to Flannery Brown and his circle. Um, and I think one would have to be careful about about questioning or doubting Sheridan. He knew um, Brown and Nolan better than most, apart from the wife, his wife, and and Niall Montgomery. 
Sheridan probably knew him as well as, as almost anyone. Um, so there's a level at which I'm sure what he's saying is right. And it's, it's a good point that he makes that having written that Swim to Birds, he, he went on to write The Third Policeman, which is, yes, it's fantastical and it's funny and playful, but it is a completely different book. He's right to say he didn't follow it up by trying to do the same thing, do a sequel. Um, there, there is a kind of there is a kind of great inventiveness uh, there. On the other hand, I think at another level, I also I'm surprised by what Sheridan says. The, the concept of originality is a concept that he questions and plays with and undermines. Um, if I remember at Swim Two Birds, there's a there's a wonderful paragraph paragraph I think where there's, there's a kind of manifesto about the novel that says um, uh, the, the modern novel should be basically a work of reference. I think that's a really good uh, sentence or statement for describing uh, Flann O'Brien's attitude to writing and literature that it's often a work of reference, quoting from somewhere else, montaging different sources together. Often Christian Law in the column is quoting somebody and quoting somebody else and maybe clashing them together, maybe writing a pastiche of something. Uh, in, in the novels, in, in At Swim Two Birds, there are passages which are sort of taken from letters that somebody had sent him or from an obscure book that he'd found. And there are passages that are basically sort of parodies or pastiches of, of Irish mythology and, and that the, the are translations, you know, quite, I think, quite fine translations of, of, I think, medieval Irish poetry. And actually, you can find this pattern going on right through the work, and we could go on and on about it, even to the fact that the Dorky Archive it recycles material from the admittedly then unpublished Third Policeman. But I think this is a writer who, um, who, who, who quotes and rehashes and makes a kind of collage art and so the, the phrase, um, the dorky archive, is strangely uh, appropriate. This is a writer who is drawing on an archive to piece things together. So I'm, I'm only going to uh, give you one more question, uh, Joe. It's been an incredibly rich um, podcast. It's going to be very difficult to edit. Um, so thank you for that. Um, but I, I, I know that this is an area potentially that's, that's of interest to you. So... As part of this podcast series, I, I'm going to be speaking to the Irish Times journalist, Frank McNally, who often writes about Flan and almost brings out columns from the past and, and is a very active participant in the Flan community. And the Irish Times is so important to why we all refer to him as Miles in the first place, yes. to where he is as a writer. Yes. And so one figure we may well discuss on that podcast is um, Robert Murray Smiley, or R.M. Smiley, as he's most commonly known um, who was the editor of the Irish Times between 1934 and, and 1954. Um, so why do you think of the, this editor figure, R.M. Smiley, is so important to understanding who Flann O'Brien was as a writer? Um, well, the short answer is that he, I guess, commissioned or, or agreed to publish um, Christian Lawn from October 1940, having had a meeting, I think, I think everyone says the first meeting between Nolan and Smiley was in the Palace Bar in Dublin, just east of east of Temple Bar. A wonderful literary pub. I think there's still pictures of, of uh, Smiley and Nolan on, on the walls there today. Um, so having ha Nolan had written these letters into the Irish Times, you know, um, sort of mocking people, as I said. And um, I believe that an, an encounter was a, a, arranged between the two. And um, uh, uh, Smiley uh, offered an, uh, an, a regular column in the Irish Times, which was going to be in Irish. Um, one reason for that certainly was that the Irish Times had a reputation as a um, very much an English uh, centric, uh, a, a pro unionist, and what might be called a West Britain uh, newspaper. Um, a Protestant newspaper as well. And therefore having a Catholic, a, co a columnist of Catholic background writing in Irish, uh, kind of broke up that identity and um, maybe opened the paper up to different kind of cultural constituencies, changed the kind of the character and the face of the paper a bit. So in that sense, maybe it's quite a bold thing for Smiley to do. 
uh, the column started in Irish and immediately was playing with Irish and playing around with what could and couldn't be said in Irish in interesting ways, but ended up going more into um, uh, alternate, alternating between English and Irish and then ultimately coming more regularly into English and, and, and occasionally breaking out into other languages, even German and, and Latin are in there. So, so Smiley's big importance is simply in commissioning Christine Lorne, which then ran for such a long time. And I don't know if it exactly dominated Anolan's life, but it was a huge feature of Anolan's life uh, for, for that the next 25 years. There is an argument that many people have often made in the past that actually that was quite a bad thing for O'Nolan, that his creative energies were um, diverted into the column when they could have been better, um, better used in, in writing more novels, writing more plays, and so on. Um, so that there is an argument that the column was, was a distraction. Um, and that if you look at it that way, maybe, maybe it was unhelpful that Smiley, Smiley commissioned him. But... Um, the, uh, on the other hand, I think we all look at the column and think this is a wonderful creation. It's brilliant. It's funny. Uh, it's it's extraordinary. There's nothing there, there's nothing else like it, not on that scale. And so Smiley had also helped to bring into being um, a, almost a kind of unique kind of literary work. Um, other editors did follow Smiley, um, but he, I think, stands as a figure of great stature within the history of of, of modern Irish journalism. I, I know, I think Terence Brown has published a book about the Irish Times, uh, which is a good context for this. And there's also been a new book called Smiley's Ireland, which I know you, Toby, have, have, have been researching and looking into as well. So I think the um, importance of Smiley and of the Irish Times in for, forming public culture at this time um, is being is being recognized. Um, I mean, the other thing to say, just one other thing there is that because Flann O'Brien often wrote short texts like columns, uh, for instance, like little essays and skits, um, editors have been very important to him. Uh, and, you know, with the recent letters, Maeve Long did sterling service with a really wonderfully professional um, and, and scholarly editing um, um, apparatus. In, in bringing together the letters. So that was one instance. Um, and there's also, uh, there was a wonderful um, Flannery O'Brien scholar called John Wise Jackson, who was one of the people that first really taught me about, about Flannery O'Brien. You know, once I got into reading him a bit more, he was not, a, not an academic, but he was a very scholarly person, a book collector and bookseller. And he also edited volumes of Flannery O'Brien, including a, a fantastic volume of early work called uh, Miles Before Miles, published in, I think, 88 originally. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, he's another great example of how editors have actually been really important to keeping Flann O'Brien's work um, in circulation and making it available to us. But again, going back, I think Smiley is the first great editor. And, you know, that the relation between him and Flann O'Brien is a very important one. Fantastic. Thank you for for sharing your thoughts on on Smiley and um, I'm sure we're going to be hearing more about Smiley as um, the focus moves on to those collaborators and those editors of, of Flann O'Brien that seem to be so important. So we could talk for many more hours um, but we're going to wrap things up there. Thank you so much Professor Joseph Brooker of Birkbeck College University of London for being on the podcast. My pleasure Toby, glad to be here. Thanks everyone, see you next time. Mm -hmm.